This conversation is brought to you in part by Calavo Growers, the family of fresh. Hey, everybody. Welcome. We're glad you're here. It's another beautiful day in America, and we're hanging out with somebody that I am thrilled to death to have here with me today. This guy's a baller. He's going to have some fun stuff. I've enjoyed his company over and over again. I learn from him every time we speak, even if we're not talking politics or agriculture, just life itself. Please, everybody, give it up for my friend, the president, President King. King, president. Which one do we decide this morning? President? I, I think president is just president. Fine. Just want to make sure. President of the Russell Group. Please welcome Randy Russell. Hey, brother. Welcome. Todd, thank you very, very much for having me. I like you. I've looked forward to having this conversation with you and your listeners. By the way, congratulations on the great success your podcast has had. Thank you. And uh, hopefully I won't screw it up for you by the end of this. So. Well, you know, hopefully I won't screw it up either. And if we do, we'll just edit it out. We'll just go about our business and we'll call it good. I, I'm just thrilled that you're here because there's so much going on in the world of ag and the world of politics and the way they, inter- you know, the way they crisscross and meet each other and, and cross paths. And, and, you know, the Russell Group has been doing stuff in the ag space for such a long period of time, so well respected. I mean, Bloomberg calls you guys one of the top performing lobby firms, you know, in the country. And I think it's interesting, you know, we get into the conversation about lobby and lobbyists and this and that, and people kind of freak out. I don't think they realize where the word came from. It really came from people standing in the lobby at the Willard Hotel, if I'm not mistaken, right, in D.C., kind of mingling. That's kind of the start back in like 1842 or something like that. Actually, it was uh, that came, Todd, from uh, when Ulysses S. Grant, Grant. in 19, excuse me, 1868, and he used yeah. to be with constituents that had grievances against the government in the lobby of the Willard Hotel. But the real predecessor of the term lobbyist actually came from Britain, where the British Parliament would meet with their constituents in the lobby of the Parliament building. That was back in the 1830s. So there you I, go. Think, I think Grant gets credit for it, but I think the uh, Brits actually uh, coined the term. Well, and I'm sure, and I'm sure because because Grant was sitting in the circle bar, he wasn't going to meet people until he was ready to come out of that. By his guess, <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. I'm sure he was in a good mood when he met with those constituents that had grievances against the government. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, the Willard. I mean, if you want to see a piece of American history, walk into the lobby of the Willard and have a drink. It's great amazing. hotel. Great oh, hotel. It's unbelievable. It's a really, it's a, it's a really iconic piece of this country that doesn't get a whole lot of airplay. So let's get into this, brother, because we got lots to talk about. And before we get started, though. Give everybody a little bit, just kind of your background, who you are, what you've done. I've kind of framed up the lobbyist thing a little bit, but just kind of frame up if you wouldn't mind, just give people a little 411. Sure. Well, I, Todd, I started in this business uh, it, with the Russell Group. It was called uh, Ling and Lesher. That's, uh, that was 36 years ago. Wow. Uh, before that, I have served in different capacities, worked in the Economic Research Service at USDA right out of college. My, Took me six months to find a job, by the way, because the unemployment rate was pretty high in 1970. Yeah. And uh, then got a job working for the Senate Agriculture Committee and then joined a new senator from Minnesota, Rudy Boschwitz, that had just gotten elected in 1979. And then uh, ultimately served uh, at the National Council of Farmer Co ops, as well as the Pillsbury Company in Minneapolis as director of government relations. I served uh, in three different jobs during the Reagan administration. Uh, chief, chief of staff was my last job for Secretary Block in 1985. Wow. And then 1986, you get rolling with this, with this, which is yes. really great. So tell everybody a little bit what the Russell Group is before I dive into my five million questions I have for you. <laughs> Todd, it's a, it is an advocacy group. And uh, we focus exclusively on agriculture and the food industry, natural resources, the environment. Uh, we have 11 members of the team, including mm-hmm. former Secretary Dan Glickman, who was an outside counsel to us. We are bipartisan. Uh, we are bicameral. We have people that have served both at USDA as well as in the White House, uh, both the House and Senate, the Agriculture Committees, the Ag Appropriations Subcommittees that fund FDA and USDA. So um, we don't try to be something that we aren't. Uh, we've said all along when Dick Wing and Bill Lesher set the firm up, we were gonna be focused on agriculture broadly defined in the food industry. And we've stayed true to that for the last uh, uh, 37 years. 
I love it. I love, well, look, what a contrast between starting this in 1986 and sitting here today thinking about this political and social climate. I mean, you have to look back and go, you know, is it like in its own scale back then just as goofy or is it just, this is just kind of the, the cherry on the Sunday for what you see, do you think? <laughs> Uh, clearly a vastly different environment <laughs> than when I uh, started on Capitol Hill, which would have been 1979 at the Ag Committee and then joined Senator Boschwitz about four or five months later. Look, Todd, I mean, back then, uh, when I joined uh, up on the Hill, the Democrats had the Senate, they had the House, they had the White House, Jimmy Carter was president. Oh. Uh, and in the Agriculture Committee, in the community, it was very bipartisan. It was much more driven by regional interest and commodity interest mm -hmm. than it was Republican versus Democrat or progressive versus conservative. Right. And we have really gotten away from that, unfortunately. And it's even now crept into, unfortunately, the agriculture issues. And I know we're going to get into some of those, I'm sure, later on. But it has definitely gotten much more polarized. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's, uh, it, it makes uh, the work that we do much more difficult to advocate successfully for the clients that we represent. Well, you, you touched on, and I want to, I want to come to this, to this point. How do, you, how do you maintain bipartisanism in today's environment? I mean, it's one thing to say that you are, but my God, we're, you, know, you get boxed in, you get boxed in at the right, you know, for the wrong moment, for the right thing, the right thing, the wrong, whatever it is. It's got to be hard. Well, dealing in the policy environment that we are, I always say that it's like we're painting on the canvas of politics. You always have to remember what the political situation is uh, as you approach an issue. So what we try to do, Todd, is we try to figure out where we want to end up in the process. Where do we want to end up? And we work backwards. And what do I mean by that? The first thing we do is we try to identify champions for our issue. And they've got to, there's got to be Democrats and there have to be Republicans and they have to be on the right committees and they have to be influential and they have to be committed. And once we identify that, then we try to get a strategy around that. Also, as you know, Todd, better than anybody or as well as I do, you don't get anything done in this town by yourself. No. So you have to build allies, partnerships, You've got to be willing to talk to people on another issue that you may adamantly be on the other side of the issue. Um, I always say I'm going to have professional differences with people, but I'm not going to personalize. And the reason for that is today they're against you. Tomorrow they may be your ally. And so right. I think that is proven even in this environment to be successful for us. Yeah, well said. No, you're you know, you're you're absolutely right. And D.C., is, is a fickle beast. And you, you know, you need to be able to communicate with everybody equally. And I think that that's something that we not doing as good of as we should be doing, because that's how you win the day, right? You, you just, right. I think it's the only way that we're going to, especially some of these larger issues, right? Some of these things we need to tackle, you've got to get everybody together at the table. I mean, you know, you've heard me say it, let's get a pizza and some beer and sit down and solve something, right? And it's a, it's a real challenge today. So I appreciate the, your perception on that. Well, it is, it is uh, much more difficult. There's a lot of reasons for that, Todd, too. Um, uh, one, uh, you take, you look at a map of the country today and red versus blue and big right. chunks of the country, if you just look on geographic size, are red. And then you look at the coast and some of the big states and they tend to be blue. So mm -hmm. clearly there is a big a divide geographically in the country. That's number one. Number two, just look at the rural-urban divide we have. Today, if you just look at rural America, we have about 35 congressional districts out of 435 that are primarily rural. Right. Well, I'm not the smartest guy in the whole world, but if you got to get to 218 votes, you've got to figure out a way on important agriculture issues to build alliances with suburban members, urban members in order to get to 218. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think what we have seen is that the extremes have taken over and you look at that middle, which is what it takes mm -hmm. it is to pass things in Congress has basically been hollowed out. And it's the extremes in both parties that have uh, unfortunately are uh, speaking for the parties. Right. Wow. It, it just amazes me how work does get done 
I think a lot of ways in this environment. And I think it goes to show how important it is to have folks like yourself that are taking on these issues that a member cannot possibly get into at the level that they need to with the thousands of things that are in front of them. So to be able to help move that along and be able to help make those positive changes is really an important role. I mean, I commend you guys for doing it because it's a challenge. I mean, I, I, I would imagine that you've got to feel like most days everything's going uphill a lot of times. Well, you do have those moments, but you know, I, I think uh, people need to understand what lobbying really is. And a vast majority of what we do is educate. Yeah. And, and a lot of that is because there's so much turnover in Congress. If you go back to two, 2009, when Congress convened in 2009, compared to today, 72% of the House members and 69% of the Senate members uh, turned over during that period. So there's massive turnover and then there's staff changes. And so uh, we have to constantly be up on the hill and within the administration, not just advocating, but educating. 80% of what we do is educate. That's an important function and one that uh, we take very seriously. Thanks for joining the Todd Versation. And now, a word from our sponsor. Hi, this is Nelia Alamo at Calavo. Thanks for listening to Todd Versations. At Calavo, we are the family of fresh. For almost 100 years, our passion has been bringing delicious and nutritious food to your table. From tasty, wholesome produce to our freshly prepared foods, Calavo is a global leader in the finest quality produce and a pioneer of healthy, fresh-cut fruits, vegetables, and prepared foods. Whether it's our farm-fresh avocados, tomatoes, Hawaiian papayas, or chef-inspired solutions including fresh-cut fruits, veggies, guacamole, and much more, Calavo takes pride in delivering our fabulously fresh products every day. It's our promise from our foodie family to yours. Check us out at Calavo.com and learn why we are excited about your fresh possibilities ahead. Yeah, you know, you, you've, you've got something that, that you've said and you talk about how people are the foundation of our government. And I think that's a really powerful statement. I think, I think sometimes we forget that as citizens. Can you explain what that means to you? You know, I've uh, actually been going back and started to read the Federalist Papers which are fascinating to read. And as your listeners know, uh, they were written by Alexander Hamilton, Hamilton and yeah. Madison and John Jay. And the purpose behind the Federalist Papers were originally to try to sell a new country on the importance of a constitution and a representative form of government. What it really did though, was to provide some insight as to what our founding fathers and the framers of the constitution wanted uh, in a representative form of government. They wanted three branches of government that had checks and balances, but mainly that defended the people's interests. Unfortunately, Todd, and you alluded to this over the last several decades, special interests have taken over and we've m- moved further and further away from really the people having that voice through the three branches of government. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Let's get into a little bit of the D.C. stuff real quick. And just because we're on it, let's keep rolling on it a little bit. When you think about, um, you know, agriculture right today and as a big hole, especially from a perspective that you have watching what's happened, what excites you today? What's out there that kind of is like, okay, I'm digging this? Uh, A couple of things uh, as I think about it. First is uh, just the young people that are coming in to this whole space, agriculture, food, forestry, natural resources. Um, You know, we just hosted a lunch here for the interns that are working for various trade associations uh, during the summer. And we had about 30 of them there. We took some of our young people over and I went over and and talked to them. And Todd, if you felt the energy in that and the excitement that they had to be getting on with their careers. I told them if I had to start my career all over again, and that would be going back 45 years, I would double down on agriculture. And why is that? Because I think we're on the cusp of what I would call a green revolution, an evergreen revolution. You know, Norman Mm -hmm. Perlow talked about in the 1950s about a green revolution. 
And that was driven by all the uh, research into genetics and everything else that was going to allow yields to grow and feed a growing world population. What we're seeing now is what I would call the evergreen revolution, and that is driven by technology mm-hmm. and data and the power of information. And also, I would say, lastly, is what I'm seeing in our space is the velocity of change is just enormous. Uh, it seems like our um, uh, the knowledge that we're gaining is turning over at a very rapid pace. To me, that's very exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I wish I had another uh, 45 years. Somehow, I think the good Lord's probably not going to uh, allow that to happen. But uh, I'm really excited about the future. That That's what we're focused on with our firm and what really excites me about our industry. Yeah, there's no doubt. And the young people are always amazing to me, especially when you go into D.C., because the passion, the, the, it's just, I, again, I go back to kind of touched on earlier. I don't think everybody realizes how many young people are involved in a member's office and how many people on staff are doing such a heavy lift to keep the member informed about what's going on, you know, about certain issues, because there's so many things. So it's great to see you giving back like that. And I know that's such an important part of of who you are as a person, too. Yeah. You know, really is. Go ahead. It it is, Todd. In fact, if you look right behind me, you'll see pictures. uh, uh, You know, we're involved in a lot of different activities, uh, nonprofit related, both our firm and my wife and I. Let me just mention a a few of those, you know, uh, really started for me uh, probably 35 years ago when I got involved in the Big Brothers program here in the National Capital Area. I uh, was matched with a a little brother, his mother's from Ghana, and uh, he grew up in low income housing here, Section 8 housing in the Washington area. And uh, we were matched when he was 11 years old. I uh, only met his father twice. Um, and uh, I became very active. Uh, he is now uh, a prosecutor in, in Arizona in the Phoenix area. Uh, and is just doing great, great things. Very, very proud of him. I served on the National Capital Area Board for Big Brothers Big Sisters. Right. So another area that we're very involved with is adoption. It's, I have six kids, my wife and I do, and our, our three youngest are adopted from China. So my wife's on the board of the National Council for Adoption, and we're very active in the adoption community. I'm also uh, chairman of the board of the World Food Program USA, yeah. which supports the World Food Program in the world. And it is the largest global feeding program in the world. And we help raise money and awareness and lobby the Congress for more public sector funding for uh, global hunger. And that's been just a great, great um, experience for me to be involved with that. I'll be stepping down as chairman at the end of the year, but been on the board for about 20 years. And then lastly, I just mentioned in the whole advocacy space, I'm on the board of the Bryce Harlow Foundation, which is a scholarship money for graduate students that are going into advocacy. And we give out about 25 scholarships or fellowships a year. And then each of the board members mentor uh, one of those fellows. And I just got my uh, sixth uh, uh, mentee here that I will start work with here in about a month. So really important, you know, look, Todd, we're here for a greater purpose. You know, we all get wrapped up in our, you know, in our business and our personal lives. But I really do believe good Lord put us here to serve others. And if I can use our business platform to help raise the visibility and to raise money and to advocate for some of these causes, uh, uh, that's one of the major reasons I stay involved. Yeah, same here. I, I, you know, it doesn't, you don't, you don't have to ask me twice to get involved in the topic that feels good to your heart and you're supposed to talk about. Let's, I got to, I got to bring up one though you didn't bring up that I love, which is a farmless ordinary. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think this is just such a neat group. I sure can. So as a firm, I was just talking personally about some of the things, but our firm really puts a high on giving back to our community. So we have for almost a dozen years done quarterly dinners at the Carpenter Shelter, which is a homeless shelter about four or five miles from our office. Got a great partnership with them. A farm less ordinary. This is a project that we got involved with uh, a few years back. And it's an organization, a nonprofit that, uh, gives job opportunities to folks that are um, that, that have certain disabilities, uh, mm-hmm. developmental disabilities. And the wonderful thing is, Todd, is that they raise produce. Yeah. So 
We've actually been out and helped them harvest the produce. We've been out and helped them plant it. Uh, we've supported some of their dinners and activities in terms of marketing. It's just a terrific organization. We're yeah. proud to partner with them. Last limit, let me just mention, we have a partnership with uh, North Carolina A&T, which is one of the historical black colleges and universities. A few years back, uh, we started a scholarship program with them. Where we give out two scholarships a year for uh, North Carolina A&T students that are studying agriculture. And we also have an internship. We just had our first, first uh, intern from North Carolina A&T this summer, Faith Jefferson, and she was just outstanding. And so we're trying to also help uh, elevate and get some young folks uh, from the African-American community, uh, so to speak, in the pipeline so that they can get jobs here in Washington when they're interested in agriculture and food policy. I love it. I mean, look, uplifting. You got to love it. What a great what a great thing to add to your day. Right. You, you go back, you have a rough, you have a rough day yes. for all the reasons you have a rough day and you go, oh, yeah, farm less ordinary. OK, I'm feeling a little better right now. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. that give back. I love, you know, well, and I, I will ahead. say this. People uh, will look at the website and they'll talk to people here and particularly younger people are, are motivated to be with organizations that are thinking beyond just lobbying, just advocacy, and frankly, just agriculture. That we're here yeah. for a better and bigger purpose. I 100% agree. And, and look, this is a, that's a big calling card to bring people into the jobs today. Is yeah. what do you believe in? What am I coming here to believe in? Yes, we make you know we manufacture a widget, but what else do we believe in? What's, where's the culture? And that's such a it's such a unique part of, I think, some of the transformation this country's gone through over the past few years is getting employers to actually recognize that this does matter to your employees. This does matter. They do want to work where their heart feels correct and where they're aligned with their values and their morals. It's, it's a really powerful thing to unite people like that under, you know, under a banner or something. Well, we, we didn't do it for that purpose, but I think it's helped us attract the team that we have here because they know that we're thinking about things just broader than this firm and its economic interest. Yeah, 100%. It's very commendable, Randy. I really is. It, it's really, really cool to see. Let's go back. I'm going to throw another, I'm going to talk to Farm Bill. The Farm Bill. So let's just, so I'm not even going to know how many pages the Farm Bill is. How thick is the Farm Bill? Is it a foot thick, you think? Eight inches thick? How thick do you think the Farm Bill is, Randy? Uh, depends upon which one you're talking about. I was going to pull one off the shelf here. I've been, this will be my ninth Farm Bill. Um, my first one was in 1981 when I was in the Reagan administration as Farm Bill coordinator. Um, and every one of them's different. Yeah. And what I have found, Todd, is that they're really driven by three things. One is what is the budget environment that you're facing at the time you write the bill? Uh, number two, what is the state of the farm economy when you write the bill? And number three, what's the political situation? And this bill, when we commence writing it in January of next year, after the midterm election on November 8th, it's going to be a real challenge on all three of those fronts. 100%. Yeah, it's going to be, it, this could be up there with one of the more difficult ones, probably of the nine that are up there behind you, or eight up there behind you. I, I, because, because the economy is what it is, the environment is what it is, the, 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 the polarization of everybody, the whole, all of it just becomes this, just it, it to your point, you're planting seeds to try to drive this country forward for five years on ag policy and to make sure that we're moving this country in food security, all the climate, whatever, whatever things you want to throw at it, comma, comma, another word. It's going to be an uphill battle in a lot of ways, I would think. One of the biggest challenges we have is looking at the overall cost mm -hmm. of the farm bill, which is ballooned, to say the least. It is projected by the Congressional Budget Office, if you were to take the existing farm bill and extend it out for 10 years, it would cost $1.3 trillion. 86% of that, Todd, is projected to be in nutrition programs, primarily SNAP, which used to be food stamps. So obviously there are gonna be people that look at that. I'm not advocating that we cut SNAP, but that's clearly going to be on the minds of some folks, particularly when you look at some of the challenges uh, that we're facing in terms of higher input prices for, for crop producers, when we have demands from specialty crop growers for increased investments, when we have uh, all kinds of pent up demand for climate smart ag practice funding and incentive money, conservation programs, trade, 
uh, you name it. Labor. So, labor is a whole nother issue. Uh, and and so I, I think this is going to be a, a real challenge for the chair and the ranking members of the Ag Committees to work their will and to get this done on time next year. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I, I agree with you 100 percent. I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be some very unique conversations that are going to be happening. What do you think? You, you talked about a, a few of the issues and I'd like to drill down if we could um, on ag labor, because I think it's just really it's such a big issue we don't seem to ever get right or we don't seem to solve. Right. And it just for whatever reason, I can come up with a bunch, but I'll save that for let's let you prognosticate on it. But what do we need to do, do you think, to finally get this ag labor issue right or at least give us some better direction? It's one of the most important issues, I think, facing agriculture broadly defined today. And it's not and it isn't just produce, although produce is principally affected by it. But sure. you look at you know, you look at the meatpacking sector, you look at the dairy sector, you look at others, and they're facing labor supply issues. Look, one of the biggest constraints we have on the produce side to increasing production is labor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've got great demand, but you got to be able to uh, plant the crop and harvest the crop in order to fulfill that demand. I think for a long time, Todd, we've looked at comprehensive immigration reform. You know, we haven't done comprehensive immigration reform since 1986, back mm -hmm. when Reagan was president. You know, people want to look at what's happening on the southern border, where we're probably going to have two and a half million encounters uh, by CBP this year. Uh, they, they look at fentanyl coming across the border from those situations, and that's a great concern. Then what do you do about the 10 and a half or 11 million illegals that are in the country today? Do you give them some kind of a path to legal certainty? Um, and then what do we do about the H-2A program, which has over 260,000 uh, people participating in it? It was never intended to have that many to begin with. Right. And what do we do about it? I personally think as much as I'd love to see comprehensive immigration reform, I think we've got to move it separately. You know, we had the uh, farm work, uh, work farm workforce modernization act passed the house right. twice. Um, there is some discussions now going on in the Senate uh, between uh, uh, Senator Bennett from Colorado and Senator Crapo, a Republican uh, from Idaho. We'll see where that goes, but I really think we have an opportunity beginning later this year after the election and into the early part of next year to address ag labor. If we miss that window, and we get into the next election cycle. Right. I think it is increasingly difficult. Yeah, I don't disagree. I, I you know, I think it, I just think it's just one of these issues where we, you know, again, pizza and beer time, guys. We got to get this right. We have got to nail this down because it's 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 we could we could use the help, right? And but we've got to do it the right way. We've got to get our heads wrapped around this, and it just can't be this, you know, this free for all at this point because nobody's winning the day with that. Well, we're going to constrain our ability to grow. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, uh, people want to talk about imports and all that. Well, we need domestic labor supply, a reliable domestic labor supply in order to produce and meet a growing demand from consumers here in the U.S. And the best way to do that is to have a reliable labor supply. And that's why we need to get this ag labor issue resolved. Yeah. I think we have an opportunity coming up. It may be yeah. a short, small window, but uh, we got to, we got to go for it. I 100% agree. And we've got to be smarter about food you know, security. We have to recognize that, you know, I think if anything that coming out of the pandemic, what do you mean we don't have any, you know, we don't produce antibiotics in the United States, right? That's a real big concern. That's another one, you know, but I mean, to the point of, we've got to make sure that we're protected with our food too. And that, you know, we have ample supplies here that because we can produce an awful lot. We need water, we need climate smart, we need labor, we need all these things that we're talking about to come together just to help, I think, shore up our, our own country to make sure that, you know, we're doing what's right. We're abs you're absolutely right. Food security. In fact, I would love to see, we were talking about the farm bill a minute ago, you know, the preamble of every farm bill, if you go back and look, Todd, most people don't read the preamble because it's, it says we're here to preserve and protect the family farm. Right. I would like the preamble of the next farm bill to say that food security is national security. Correct. Because all else flows from that. And if, the pandemic didn't teach us that, then certainly what's happened in Eastern Europe with the Russian and Ukrainian crisis has 
another signal to us. And also don't think for a minute that we shouldn't be concerned about China and what's gonna be going on with China. And it is a, I think, the number one issue that this president and future presidents are gonna to have to deal with is how do you maintain a commercial relationship with China at the same time when they're doing what they're doing with the value of the yuan, uh, right. with actions in the South China Sea, uh, with uh, all their uh, belts and road initiative where they're investing in third world countries to get them indebted on infrastructure projects. Yeah. The list goes on and on and on, and that is gonna be a huge challenge for us going forward. 100% agree. I don't think people recognize how much farmland China is buying up, right? You look at South America. I mean, look, they're they're doing they they recognize food security is a big deal, and that's what they're working on from a government level to make sure that they shore up a lot of supplies of food. Uh, there the is a China. There is a Chinese company, Fu Fang, uh, that is an agriculture company that is trying to buy 300 acres of land about 20 minutes from Grand Fork uh, Air Force Base in North <laughs> North Dakota. Why? All the places in the United States does a Chinese company with the backing of the Chinese Communist Party need to be build, building a milling facility 20 minutes from yeah. where we store intercontinental no ballistic, ballistic missiles. Right. You got to wonder. Well, right. I thought the property butted up to their perimeter fence. Uh, I, I don't think it's quite that close. I thought but, it was that close. I thought about I could be wrong. I but, thought it did. But I, it's, yeah. But it's it, it, close anywhere, enough. anywhere in that proximity to me. Yeah. Uh, it's just something that the government needs to take a very, very hard look at. Yeah, I don't disagree. Whether it's communication issues, things like that, different cell, cell phone, tower, all these different things. We've got to be smarter, you know, and, and the farm bill is a, is a part of that whole logical process, right? Children's nutrition, all these things that we need to be thinking about. Again, it goes back to food security. A country that is food insecure is, is it's a problem and it's, it's not going to help us in the long game. And we've got to get smarter about taking care of our own house in a lot of ways. And I'm, I'm a big believer that it starts with the farm bill. It starts with our farmers. It starts with, you know, trying to make sure that we are uh, a strong nation when it comes to being able to take care of ourselves, especially when it comes to our, what we're eating every day. Well, there needs to be some reciprocity too in this whole process. I mean, I'll give you a great example. Uh, back uh, several years ago, uh, WH group, Ended up behind Nifty, uh, a large hog producer, uh, and uh, you know that th with the backing of the Bank of China. And again, I, 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 these these transactions need to be looked at very very closely. Not just farmland, but assets and facilities mm -hmm. here in the United States, and also where are they located and why? Right. Yeah. No. I. I we've got to do a better job of protecting our interests. And these are not, we shouldn't be conversations that we read about um, after the fact. These should be conversations that are happening before they become facts. And we need to do a better job of it. I mean, I just, I, I look at, um, you know, to your point, what's happening on a global scale, uh, the infrastructure that's being afforded to countries and what it means and what they're giving up, whether they're giving up water rights or giving up mineral rights, sure. um, you know, especially with conflict, or conflict minerals, et cetera. It's a real challenge out there. It's a real mm -hmm. challenge. I mean, it's, time to, it's time to be, I think, a little bit smarter about what we're doing when it comes to all this. And ag's no exception. No exception. I think you're going to see that in the next farm bill. I think we're going to have a real debate about uh, disclosure mm -hmm. of foreign, uh, assets here in the U.S. and uh, not just farmland, but other assets. Uh, and I think that's a healthy thing. Yeah, I, I don't also think I think you're going to see the Secretary of Agriculture also added to what we call the CFIUS Committee, which is the committee that reviews all in foreign investments in the United States that might be economically and national security sensitive. And I think right now the Secretary of Agriculture is not a permanent member of that. And I think you'll see the Secretary added as a permanent member because well, food security is national security. 100%. Yeah. And that's why I love and I appreciate you saying it. I appreciate having the opportunity to elevate that conversation for folks to just think a little bit about it. You know, we don't think about it. We're, we're, it's real easy to jump in, the, jump in the rig, cruise the store and buy what you want, you know, and we don't think a lot about where did that actually come from? And that that becomes a real problem. We need to start doing more of that as a country. So I'm glad that we're having a conversation. We're elevating a little bit, get people thinking. I love it. 
I love it. I really do. One thing I want to go back to, and I can't, for, and I don't want to uh, be remiss in bringing up into the farm bill, which is a, an issue that is important to me. I know it's important to you is child nutrition. I'm all about how do we increase consumption? It's how we win the day, food waste, you know, all these different things. So I'll give you a really broad question. And here we go. I'm going to give you your, your magic wand, wave it really quick and just say, <laughs> how do we win the day on trying to help and, and to drive child nutrition? Well, let's level set for a second on child nutrition. You know, I, I view child nutrition as a great opportunity, particularly for the produce industry to get the next generation, generation. of Americans uh, eating a healthier diet of which produce is front and center. So yeah. I, I, that, that really is our objective. I know the International um, uh, Fresh Produce Association is very focused on that and many, many others in our industry. So that's job one, but let's level set here for a second. If you look at yeah. school breakfast program, 15 million uh, American kids participate in school breakfast program. School lunch, over 30 million American kids participate in school lunch. The women, infant and children program has over 11 million participating. Then you go to, well, what are Americans consuming today? So if you look at it only uh, of adult Americans recommended by the CDC in terms of requirements, only 9% of adult Americans are eating the recommended amount of vegetables and only 12% on fruit. They're not eating the one and a half to two cups of vegetables that's recommended by CDC for vegetables. And all the, the recommendation for fruit is two to three cups of fruit a day. Now, one level coming out of the pandemic when unfortunately we saw people with comorbidity factors contribute to, to deaths, unfortunately, mm -hmm. very unfortunately from COVID, uh, we need to look at not just food security, but nutritional security. And Secretary yep. Bolsack, I think, does a really good job of saying it's not just calories, but it's the quality of the calories that we're giving people. These programs that I just outlined, school breakfast, school lunch, the Women, Infant, and Children program are three great examples of where the government can help incentivize and get in more fresh fruit and fresh vegetables uh, into the program, which creates a whole new generation of consumers down the road. Yeah, uh, I, I agree wholeheartedly. That would be the way I would love to wave the wand, too, because I think it's so important that we start to educate. It's one thing that I've been, been harping on for a while on this broadcast is that I think a lot of times we spend so much time worrying about Bob's blueberry and the fact that we want to get Bob's name on the blueberries in front of everybody versus the fact that if we could talk to people through that platform about the benefits of blueberries, when you think about only 14% of breakfast users put fruit on their cereal, right? So, I mean, you know, again, another opportunity, but the Bob part of it isn't winning the day. The blueberry part is where we need to put the energy because, you know, you want to reduce food waste, let's increase fruit and vegetable consumption. Right. I mean, it, it goes hand in hand. And I think this is an opportunity to your point of educating and getting people to recognize that, you know, I, I think sometimes we have a tendency to lead with with fear as opposed to leading with encouragement. Right. right. If, if you yes. don't eat, if you don't eat five, you know, you don't eat five, whatever the number is, you're going to die. Right. That's not, you know, is it going to does it affect that? Yeah. Long term, I get all that. But that's the message. that's not winning with people, which is why you're not seeing some changes are happening why we're not getting over that hump, right? We need to start encouraging people to say, try this. This is, you know, this, that we, we just don't in a lot of ways. And it, it gets to be a real challenge. Well, two points on that. Uh, number one, I view this as a great opportunity for our industry. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, when we're talking about 9% on uh, fresh vegetables and 12% on fresh fruit, uh, those numbers are, are, are poor. But look at the upside. Look at the enormous upside if we can increase those percentages. That's number one. Number two, I think what's really important is getting back to the fact that coming out of the pandemic, obesity rates are up, yep. type two diabetes is up, juvenile diabetes is up, heart disease is up, life expectancy fell almost three years. Years, yeah. And so I'm not talking fear, those are just facts. And Nutritional security, as Secretary Vilsack and others have been talking about, is part of this to linking to improved health, to improve life expectancy, to reduce mm -hmm. health care costs and government health care costs. So mm -hmm. there's a lot riding on this. I think we're at a unique moment and we need to seize the moment. Thanks for joining the Todd Versation. And now a word from our sponsor.
Hi, this is Nelia Alamo at Calavo. Thanks for listening to Todd Versations. At Calavo, we are the family of fresh. For almost 100 years, our passion has been bringing delicious and nutritious food to your table. From tasty, wholesome produce to our freshly prepared foods, Calavo is a global leader in the finest quality produce and a pioneer of healthy, fresh cut fruits, vegetables, and prepared foods. Whether it's our farm fresh avocados, tomatoes, Hawaiian papayas, or chef-inspired solutions including fresh-cut fruits, veggies, guacamole, and much more, Calavo takes pride in delivering our fabulously fresh products every day. It's our promise from our foodie family to yours. Check us out at calavo.com and learn why we are excited about your fresh possibilities ahead. I agree, and I'll give you, I'll give you a little fact that you can put in your back pocket and you can, get a, you can win a drink for this one. In America, I'll give you a simple food waste number. In America, the food waste problem in this country is the equivalent of every American, every American, 330, however many million people, throwing away 650 small to medium-sized apples apiece. (laughs) So when you think about insecurity, food security, nutrition, all these other things, it's like, huh, how's that factor into it? But again, it's, it's all a part of these conversations that need to be happening. And I think it's so important that folks like you are there uh, helping people understand the perspectives that oftentimes get lost in some of these things, especially in something like the farm bill that is, you know, thousands of pages and it's a big read. And, and, you know, it's really important to keep members, the public, consumers, advocacy groups, all of it informed as to the things we've just talked about, the ways to find that positive solution that uplifts this country in so many different positive ways. I do want to go back to the farm bill just for a second. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned it. You know, you think about a farm bill. Uh, if, if, if that were a label that the FDA had to approve, it would be considered uh, unacceptable. It would be considered false and misleading. Why do I say that? Yeah. Because if you look at the farm bill, 86% of the costs are nutrition programs. So that means yeah. if you look in entirety, research, trade programs, farm programs, rural development, energy, and the like, crop insurance represents about 14% in totality of the entire farm bill. Um, it is a bit of a misnomer. Yeah, it's 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 something. I, I hope people get. In, I hope more and more people get involved. I hope these broadcasts help people kind of step up a little bit, and start to read a little bit more, and pay more attention. But we need those nutrition programs that we just talked about. They're vitally important, including yeah. the supplemental nutrition assistance program. And why do we need it? I go back to what I said earlier, Todd. Thirty-five members of Congress represent rural areas. Yeah. We need 218 votes to pass a farm bill. Nutrition programs are critically important to getting suburban, urban members to vote for farm bills. Absolutely. No, yeah, well said. Absolutely well said. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be fun to watch. I'm glad you're there. I'm glad I can just like email and go, hey, what's going on? <laughs> uh, you do that anytime. Happy to talk to you about it. You know? And you know, well, yeah. one other thing, one other thing yeah. to mention, we've got an important conference coming up. You know, the White House has announced this. Uh, conference on um, nutrition. Nutrition. Yeah. It's going to be September 28th. I got to tell you, we still don't know exactly uh, the, uh, you know, who's going to be invited, but I do think it's a great opportunity for the produce industry to highlight the importance of, of nutrition and the role that produce plays in nutrition and health. And so, um, you know, I think it'll be a really good opportunity. You know, the first one was back during the Nixon administration. Uh, No, I was not there, Todd. So I know you were thinking that. No, I wasn't going to ask you that. I knew that. I could do the math. You were, you were, you were going to rattle that off, but some major initiatives came out of that, you know, significant expansion of the food stamp program, now SNAP, school breakfast, school lunch, expansion of the WIC program. So, um, you know, I, I don't know we're going to have those kinds of lofty uh, achievements out of this, but anytime we can get a focus on the importance of nutrition and health, uh, I think that's a good thing for our industry. I do too, brother. Sign me up. Where do we got to go? What where what what, what room are we meeting in? I'm in, <laughs> right? Because I think again, we've got to keep these conversations because it's so. Those topics are just one part of a massive iceberg. We need to make sure that we protect and that we you know that we secure for this country. So. It's all a part of what needs to be discussed. 
I love it. So you got, we're going to get, I can't let you go without touching on this. Um, you're involved with the Organic Produce Association, OPA. Um, tell everybody what it is. Tell, tell everybody what's going on and uh, give us a little 411 on that one. Well, Todd, you, you, you asked me a question earlier on what excites you. Well, this is a project that we've gotten involved with about a year ago. The Organic Produce Association was set up uh, just a, a little more than a year ago. We actually just put out a press release today announcing uh, Theo Crisantes from Wholesome as our yep. uh, chair. And Theo is doing a great, great job. Our founding members uh, are Nature Sweet, uh, Nature Fresh, Master Nardis, and Mr. Lucky's. Uh, and we're very proud to be associated with this. What we're trying to do is help manage it as well as also uh, be the advocates for uh, the organic produce industry. Now, why did why is this so important? If you look at uh, organic produce sales in 2021, it was $9 billion. They rose 5.5%. So we think there's just a great opportunity to advance the cause specifically for organic produce, taking nothing away from other organizations that represent sure. produce or do work on organic. Our founding members felt it was imperative that we have an organization that speaks with one voice, both for controlled environment ag, as well as uh, open field agriculture that is in organic produce. And uh, uh, we're really excited about this project and the progress that's being made. I love it. So what do you guys, you got a little, what are you guys working on? What are some of the areas of concern at this yeah. point that you guys are focused on? Well, we're spending a lot of time, obviously, working with the National Organic Program leaders and had a lot of conversations uh, with them. Uh, Jenny Tucker and the crew were having regular conversations with. She's the best. We're very excited about that. And she's been terrific to our organization. We've had a fly in where we brought our founding members in and met with USDA as well as on the Hill with the House and Senate Agriculture Committees. Um, we are uh, working on setting up some uh, guidelines and some input on the container issue, which is very important to the industry. We've been working on organic seed supply related issues, which is also very, very important. We provided some input on uh, some of the uh, initiatives that they've had in terms of trying to change the NO SB in terms of its uh, oversight and its ability to put some of its regulations uh, in place without going to the secretary. Um, so I think that you're going to see us very active working with the NOP and with the board to advance the cause of both production and consumption of organic produce. One last thing, we, yeah. are, in, we are in favor of any method of production for organic produce that meets the regulations uh, of the NOP. It's that simple. It's not mm -hmm. even more complicated than that. And that's something that we're advocating very strongly at USDA and on the Hill. Well, look, at the end of the day, Randy, you know as well as I do, we're going to have to feed 9.5 billion people on this planet, plus the aliens, which they're coming, I'm convinced, <laughs> right? I mean, you know what I know it. And um, we got to get smart about it. So when you start talking about climate smart, you start talking about alternative methods of production, whether it's a warehouse in the middle of, you know, Detroit that's providing, you know, community agriculture uh, to the citizens there. It's relevant and it means something and it's important and it can't be discredited. And I think that you you make a really good point that I think we need to really take a hard look at is that how are we going to feed all these people and why can't we feed them organic food? And the question is, is that we're not going to do it unless we start to embrace other agricultural technologies. I'm sure the guys that were selling draft horses are pissed off the tractor guys, but that's the way the world works, right? There's no more pay phones. Everybody's got them in their back pockets. I get that. And I think we have to be, you know, we have to have our eyes wide open when we look at this stuff. Not everything out there is good. Don't get me started on some of this gene editing, all these other crazy technologies that are out there that are, could be dangerous. But I don't think that, you know, you should, you shouldn't play mother nature, you should work with mother nature. So when you get into a conversation about climate smart, organics should be leading that charge from a multiplicity of, of angles. And I think that we've got to start to, to help educate folks into that, especially within the industry. Well, Todd, you've got a broad and vast uh, audience that listens to your podcast. Anybody that's interested, uh, we put up today our new website. It's at www 
organic produce, A-S-S-O-C.com. That's www.organicproduceassoc.com. We would welcome anybody that's interested in participating to contact us and uh, uh, love to have you join. I love it. Well, I'm glad you la- you added the OC there at the end. Uh, you know, that, that could have got slippery there. That could have got a little slippery. Just saying. No, I'm I love gonna, it. I'm not going to touch that one. Let's move on. No, I know. It's okay. I can't. Okay. We have it. You know, I, I've got, I've got, I'll, I'll get other, I'll get other hate mail for today's conversation. That won't be it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's, it's a thrill to have you here. No two ways about it. And, but I have to ask another question before we go. And I know we're going to run out of time here. What, if, what is your biggest aha moment in politics? What's the biggest thing that, you know, that you look at and go, God, that was really, Aha, that was amazing. Besides yeah. today, besides today, you can say today and we'll move on. This this was a uh, this certainly is on my top five list. OK, maybe not number. But, five, but yeah, but you didn't say what the what the heading of the top five list is. So I'm not going to buy into that. Hell, if you said, <laughs> you said, aha, all I could think about was there was a group from Norway called uh, called Aha back there in was. the 1980s that had a. Uh, Hit, hit single, I think. Uh, take it on me. I take, remember yeah, my uh, favorite. Yeah, yeah. You know what? All I'm right. going to play that. Uh-huh. Uh, well, let me put it this way. So when I was chief of staff uh, in 1985 for Secretary Block, we were in the middle of probably the worst farm recession. Not probably. Uh, the worst farm recession, recession we have had since the Great Depression. It was a very humbling experience, Todd, to be working at USDA when you saw the debt to asset ratio for agriculture at about 23%. We saw farm asset values fall by 30%. Our exports were declining rapidly. Our farm program costs were going through the roof. The farm credit system needed a bailout and we were in a hell of a mess in agriculture. We were also writing a farm bill at that time. And Secretary Block came to me one day and he was very concerned because the banks we're foreclosing on so many farmers. And he said, there's got to be a way that we could you know, loosen up on some of the, the commercial independent banks and also the farm credit system. We need a meeting with Fed chair. Well, that was Paul Volcker back then. And so I said, well, Jack, we'll try. So I went to work on it. And sure enough, we were able to get a meeting with Paul Volcker uh, back in 1985. And he came over to USDA and met with Secretary Block, and uh, uh, and Jack asked me to join the meeting. So here's there's three of us in talking, you know, Jack and I talking to Paul Volcker. Now Paul Volcker is a very large man. I stood about six foot seven, uh, and you know why he was in the job he was in, and that was, and it's very relevant to today. His job was to uh, knock and out of the economy. Now remember, Todd, we had. A 22, over 20% prime interest rate, over 20% prime interest rate. We had double digit unemployment and uh, we were facing double digit inflation. So uh, he was catching hell from every quarter of the economy. How is everyone else? Jack did the best job he could lobbying uh, Chairman Volcker to loosen up on the bank so we weren't going to have as many foreclosures. And he looked at him as, as he was chopping on a cigar after, after the uh, uh, meal. And he said, Mr. Secretary, I understand what you're saying. And I understand the pain that's going on in agriculture and the rest of the economy. But I have a job to do and I'm going to do it. And it's called we're going to wring inflation out of the economy. And damned if he didn't do it. And it was at a steep price. Yeah, it that was. was a, Real lesson for me. First of all, I was 30 yeah. years old. I was going to say greenhorn, look green. And, but second of all, how principled, you talking about getting the hell beaten out of me on all corners. But he stood by what his mission was and his purpose was, and he never lost sight of it. That was a hell of a lesson for me yeah. to learn 30 years. I love it. What a great way to wrap up our time. What's anything exciting and new you want to tell? We got OPA. We talked about anything new. Coming up for the rest of the year for the Russell Group? Uh, besides well, besides uh, me coming back to see you. Uh, you come back anytime. And anytime you want me to join you back on the podcast, happy to well, do it. Well, I, yeah, we, only got, we only got to four, I just got 4,800 questions left. We got to come back. <laughs> <laughs> 
Look, we're excited about the farm bill coming up. We're excited about the prospects of working on immigration. And you know what what we focus on are the opportunities. You know, we got to look at the challenges. We have multiple, but we're we're excited about those opportunities. We're excited about as a firm growing. We're excited about um, always trying to do a better job for our clients. Uh, but but most of all, I, I just want to say what a pleasure it's been being with you today with your listeners and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Pleasure's been on mine, brother. You're welcome back anytime. I really appreciate you being here. I think it's important that people get some perspective that they don't necessarily always get an opportunity to hear from. And I think yours is incredibly valuable. So thank you for sharing. My pleasure. Good seeing you, Todd. Thanks, but Hey, everybody, thanks for hanging out with us. Like I tell you all the time, go inspire somebody. If this conversation doesn't make you read a little deeper and think a little harder about what we're doing in our country about food, I don't know how to help you, but I'm trying awful hard by putting these things out there so we can help each other. Let's keep talking about it. That's how we're going to win the day. Thanks for being here. See you on social media, TLC underscore Todd Versations. We're there with the cool kids just like you. So go check us out. Randy, I love you, brother, and I'll see you soon. I really do appreciate it. Take care, everybody.